Hello and welcome to Breaking Down Bad Books, a podcast analysing trashy bestsellers from a literary perspective, and today we're looking at chapters 5, 6 and 7 of The Da Vinci Code. Where we left off. Robert Langdon got roped into this murder investigation, but first things first, every single Parisian had to ask him his opinion on like landmarks in Paris. They're like, oh, what do you think of the Louvre? What do you think of the pyramids? What do you think of the Eiffel Tower? And no matter what he said, it was always the wrong answer. He'd be like, yeah, I quite like it. And they'd be like, it's a scar on the face of Paris. And you're like, oh, well, fuck my drag, right? Like, (laughs) can't win. And Silas, the man with albinism, he uh, had a phone call from the teacher and now he's got instructions to go and rob some church because he thinks that Jacques Sunier, the curator, I don't know if you know this, but he's a curator. He thinks that Jacques Sunier was telling the truth and that the keystone, which is just a piece of stone with a key written onto it, is located in some church in Paris. Okay, we're all up to date. Let's move on. But before we do, I just want to do a quick plug for the Patreon. So if you go to patreon.com slash breaking down bad books for $3 a month, you can get access to the bonus episodes. Every Friday, I release an episode looking at the Maze Runner. And you can also access the old content, which is 50 Shades Darker, 365 Days, Insurgent, And I also released a bonus episode looking at the 365 Days movie sequel, This Day on Netflix, which is just a dumpster fire of a film. Very, very sexy stuff though, I will just say that. But let's get back into The Da Vinci Code. So we start chapter five in a new locale. Where is that locale? Well, Dan Brown will tell us. He says, Murray Hill Place, the new Opus Dei World Headquarters and Conference Center is located at 243 Lexington Avenue in New York City. I'm like, okay, you're really blowing up their spot with the full address details. He's doxing Opus Dei. We need to know specifically that it's 243 Lexington Avenue. Just say New York. We've heard of New York. I don't need the cross street. And also the new Opus Dei World Headquarters Center. He loves saying everything's new. Everything happened recently. And I looked it up and it was four years prior to the book publication that they actually moved into that headquarters. So four years isn't technically new where I come from, but okay, Dan, I'll let that one slide. It's not as egregious as how you were referring to the Louvre pyramids last week. And Dan tells us with a price tag of just over 47 million, the 133,000 square foot tower is clad in red brick and Indiana limestone. Do we need to know any of this? It seems... Seems completely unnecessary to know the, the, the cost and the square footage. Oh, and designed by May and Pinska, uh, the building contains over 100 bedrooms, six dining rooms, libraries, living rooms, meeting rooms, and offices. Okay. Are we on selling Sunset all of a sudden? Like, why are we getting the tour? Are you, are you trying to sell me 243 Lexington Avenue? Then he says the second, eighth, and 16 floors contain chapels, ornamented with millwork and marble. Okay, that's three chapels in one bit. That's a lot of chapels. That's probably one too many. Even two too many, perhaps. Hey, that could be three too many. And then Dan says the 17th floor is entirely residential. Uh, Okay. But now I'm just thinking, okay, so first floor, presumably that's the entrance. That's the lobby. Second, eighth and 16th floors, chapels. 17th floor, residential. What are the other floors? Are floors three to seven and nine to 15 just abandoned? Ooh, okay. So then we go into some detail, which is actually interesting. Uh, The men enter the building through the main doors on Lexington Avenue. Women enter through a side street and are, in quotes, acoustically and visually separated, end quote, from the men at all times within the building. Sounds amazing, ladies, am I right? Like how often have you wanted to go into a building and be like acoustically and visually separated from having to see and hear men? Like you just know that the Opus Dei, they did this as a sexist act because they don't want to see women, but also like the women are probably like, thank fuck. They're probably having the best time and the men are oblivious. Or they're being horribly discriminated against because of their gender. That's more likely. I'm just trying to put an optimistic spin on it. And then Dan tells us that there's also a penthouse And in that penthouse lives Bishop Manuel Arangorosa. And he's been packing a small travel bag and he's dressed in a traditional black cassock. He normally would have worn this purple thingy around his waist so people would know his status, but he's not going to do that now because he doesn't want to draw attention to himself. (sighs) This is all one paragraph and it's still going. 
This is going to be a long episode if this is just one paragraph. Jesus Christ. Okay. And so then he says, only those with a keen eye would notice his 14 karat gold bishop's ring with purple amethyst, large diamonds, and hand-tooled maitre crozier applique. Okay. All right. So he's trying to, he's trying to be discreet, this bishop. He's like, I'm not going to wear my big fancy little bishop clothes. I'm just going to wear a plain black cassock and no one's going to notice my ring because my ring, you know, it's only 14 carats with an amethyst and large diamonds. Like that's not ostentatious at all. Why does he think that's being subtle? It's very noticeable actually. And so then he throws his travel bag over his shoulder. (laughs) He leaves the penthouse apartment. He goes down to the lobby. There's a driver waiting to take him to the airport. And this is all in that paragraph with the, with the background of the building. Like, oh my God. But apparently that was all a flashback within the same paragraph because now we change tense and he's sitting on a plane bound for Rome and he's gazing out the window, staring at the dark Atlantic, just so we know what ocean he's staring at. Okay. And also he says, he doesn't say plane. He says now sitting aboard a commercial airliner, like, all right, boomer. Like who calls it a commercial airliner? He's been so specific. I'm surprised he hasn't told us what airline it is. Like, now sitting on a Delta flight. So this bishop guy, Aaron Garosa, he says the sun had already set, but his own star was on the rise. <laughs> Tonight, the battle will be won. He thinks back on how only a few months ago he had felt powerless against the hands that had threatened to destroy his empire. So then we are flashing back again and we're getting the backstory on this guy. So he's the president general of Opus Day, and he'd spent the last decade of his life spreading the message of God's work. And then they tell us all about the background of the Opus Dei. Show me, don't tell me, Dan. Show me, don't tell me. So Opus Dei, the congregation was founded in 1928 by a Spanish priest, Jose Maria Escriva. Okay, who gives a shit? And this guy promoted a return to conservative Catholic values. Oh, yep. And encouraged members to make sweeping sacrifices in their own lives in order to do the work of God. Sounds like a cult. And you'd think... Dan Brown would leave it there. That's all we need to know, surely. But no, he continues, Opus Dei's traditionalist philosophy initially had taken root in Spain before Franco's regime, but with the 1934 publication of Jose Maria Escriva's spiritual book, The Way, 999 Points of Meditation for Doing God's Work in One's Own Life, Escriva's message exploded across the world. Oh, that's a lot of detail. Now there's been 4 million copies of that book in 42 languages. Why do I need to know any of this? We just left a murder in the Louvre. I feel like all momentum has been halted. So apparently this Opus Dei, it's everywhere. They're in universities. They're in every major city on the earth. They're the fastest growing and most financially secure Catholic organization in the world. But also they get some criticism because of their wealth and power. (laughs) Okay, fair enough. (laughs) Heaven forbid someone be critical of an organization that's super wealthy and sexist. I mean like, oh, oh, how dare anybody question it. And so then Dan Brown's flashing us back to some reporter asking the bishop a question. And so the reporter often challenged. Oh, so it's not a specific reporter that we're flashing back to. It's just, I don't know, like a a, a general summary, which, hey, try doing that a bit more, Dan. A general summary would be nice every now and then. So many call Opus Dei a brainwashing cult, reporters often challenged. Others call you an ultra conservative Christian secret society. Which are you? Okay, and it, it does seem... Like we're flashing back to a specific conversation that's not specific. Because then the bishop saying we are a Catholic church. Yes, a small portion of the Opus Dei, they do do the chastity and the atonement for sins through self-flagellation. Like what of it? But there are many levels of involvement. Thousands of members are married, have families. The choices are personal, but blah, blah, blah. We're doing God's work. And then we flash back on some of the scandals that have overtaken Opus Dei. So two months ago, All right, well, two months from when, Bishop Arangorosa? Two months ago, an Opus Dei group at a Midwestern university had been caught drugging new recruits with mescaline in an effort to induce a euphoric state that neophytes would perceive as a religious experience. Oh, we've been there. Am I right, ladies? (laughs) Oh, and another university student had almost gone into like toxic shock from wearing that stupid belt that cuts into their thighs. Like who would have foreseen that? That's just crazy. No one could have seen that coming. And then in Boston, not long ago, okay, so now we're being less specific. The university incident two months ago, but this one, no, not long ago. When exactly? Ah, who knows? A disillusioned young investment banker signed over his entire life savings to Opus Dei before attempting suicide. Oh, 
Oh, what a wild ride. I love that the bishop who's trying to defend Opus Dei is just bringing all this up to us in narration somehow. And you'd think that's all, but no. Dan Brown Googled them and he's going to put every little bit of information he got off the Wikipedia into his book. And he says, the ultimate embarrassment had been the widely publicized trial of FBI spy Robert Hansen who in addition to being a member of Opus Dei, had turned out to be a sexual deviant. And how often does that happen, ladies, am I right? Dan's writing about this as if that's a big reveal, that's a big shock, but it's like, oh, someone who was high up in politics, religion, law, they ended up being a sexual deviant? Like, oh, wow, oh, that must be the first time that's ever happened. But apparently this guy, Robert Hansen, who is a real guy, because everything in this book is real, He had rigged hidden video cameras in his own bedroom so his friends could watch him having sex with his wife, yet she didn't know about it. So yeah, very deviant. And then, of course, conspiracy theorists started popping up, the bishop reckons, although they might just be like truth defenders, who knows. So then Dan tells us that there's (laughs) an Opus Dei awareness network, also known as ODAN, and they have a popular website. I love that Dan's telling us that it's a popular website. Like, do you have the stats? I don't know, but it's a popular website. And then he includes the the link, the URL, the hyperlink. It says www.odan.org, just in case you want to go and check it out. This is such a Wikipedia article. Why am I reading all of this? So ODAN basically just report on all of the craziness from Opus Dei. But then recently, however, okay, more recently, So probably more recent than the university incident, but maybe just like less recent than the Boston investment banker, maybe. I don't know. The timeline's murky. But recently, Opus Dei had found itself threatened by a force more powerful than the media. An unexpected foe from which Arangarosa could not possibly hide. And Dan, for once, actually doesn't really tell us what he's talking about, which is quite nice. It's nice to have a bit of mystery in this mystery novel for once. That's great. And so Aaron Garros is staring out of the window of the plane, just thinking that the war has begun. And then he catches his reflection. Again, because we can't get a character description unless we're looking at a reflection. So apparently he has an awkward face, dark and oblong, dominated by a flat crooked nose that had been shattered by a fist in Spain when he was a young missionary. Detail on detail on detail. And then as the jet passed over the coast of Portugal, The cell phone in his cassock began vibrating in silent ring mode. (laughs) All right, you should really turn that off. And, And he knows it too. He says, despite airline regulations prohibiting the use of cell phones during flights, Arangarosa knew that this was a call he could not miss. Only one man possessed this number, the man who had mailed Arangarosa the phone. So he's like, I can't miss this phone call. So I'm gonna have my phone on during flight, even though that's not allowed. But like, how are you getting reception? What plan are you with? What provider are you with to be flying over the coast of Portugal and still getting clear reception? And even though he's not meant to be on the phone, on the plane, he answers the call and he has a full on conversation with this guy. And I'm like, is, is the person next to him not like waving down the flight attendant being like, this cunt's on the phone, we're gonna crash. Cause I believe back in 2003, if someone had a phone on a plane, we all pretty much assumed that we were gonna crash, right? but no flight attendants doing the rounds to, you know, tell him to get off his phone. So the caller says, we, we don't know who it is. They're just referred to as the caller, but it's clearly the same person who is the teacher that was talking to Silas because he says, Silas has located the keystone. It's in Paris within the church of Saint-Sulpice. We need your influence to obtain it. And so Aaron Gross is like, yeah, all right, tell me what to do. And so then Aaron Garosa switched off the phone. Which I, okay. I thought it was so important that you had to have this phone on you at all times. Why are you switching it off now? What if the caller calls back? What if he forgot to say something and he's like, oh, just by the way. So then once again, he's gazing out, in, <laughs> out of the window, feeling dwarfed by the events that he had put in motion. And then we hear 500 miles away, the albino named Silas. Like you could just say Silas. We know at this point that he has albinism. Just say Silas. Silas is washing all the blood off his back because he just whipped the shit out of himself. And then he quotes Psalms, which says, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow, which feels a touch on the nose, doesn't it? Considering his condition. And then, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, this book. So then Silas starts to feel aroused because he's washing his wounds. 
Silas was feeling an aroused anticipation that he had not felt since his previous life. Okay. Um, well, that's just a segue into a bloody flashback about Silas. Oh, my goodness gracious me. So for the last decade, Silas had been following the way. Cleansing himself of sins, rebuilding his life, erasing the violence in his past. Okay, so he's erasing the violence in his past, but he shot four people just this weekend. (laughs) Okay, Silas. And he's trying to reconcile that, I think, because he's thinking about how Jesus's message is one of peace and of nonviolence and of love. And yet he also has the message that the enemies of Christ are now threatening to destroy him or some bullshit like that. So he has to meet violence with violence. It says, for two millennia, Christian soldiers had defended their faith against those who tried to displace it. Tonight, Silas had been called to battle. So it's just justifying killing people, which is, you know, always a hoot to read about. So he fixes up his wounds. He puts on a hooded robe and it was plain, made of dark wool, accentuating the whiteness of his skin and hair. Okay, we get it, Dan. Dan, we get it. And then he's admiring... (laughs) His red eyes are admiring his own reflection in the mirror. And then he thinks the wheels are in motion. And that's the end of that chapter. What a mess of a chapter. Half Wikipedia, three different tenses, two different POVs. We're getting a cell phone with global roaming, with great coverage just on the coastline of Portugal. Uh, Wild, wild chapter. So chapter six is next. And we're back with Robert Langdon, which I feel like is where we want to be. But if you're hoping for some progress with the whole murder investigation, eh, not so much just yet. So where we left him, he was just squeezing through the security gate, which cannot be lifted higher, but it could be lifted up a few inches. So just lift the whole thing up. I, I don't understand it. And of course, remember, it's the Louvre and it's at night and it's empty. So it's very creepy. They haven't put all the lights on, just that red light that museums use. And Langdon's looking up at all of the Da Vinci's, the Caravaggio's, all these famous paintings, even though we can't really see them because of the red tinged light, but whatever. And then, and then Dan Brown gives us a little history lesson again. He says, although the grand gallery housed the Louvre's most famous Italian art, many visitors felt that the wing's most stunning offering was actually its famous parquet floor. Like, oh, it's a famous floor, is it? Also, who are these many visitors? I'd like to have a chat to them. Has anyone done an exit poll of tourists coming out of the Louvre and said, oh, what was the most impressive? And they all said, the floor. The floor actually was, was stunning compared to the Mona Lisa. Venus de Milo, piece of shit, but the floor of the Grand Gallery, oh. Like who's saying that? No one's saying that, Dan. You came up with that in your head. I don't know why you're obsessed with the floor. I've been to the Louvre. I looked down at the floor of the Louvre and I said, I don't get it. It's just a floor, Dan. It's just a floor but apparently it's laid out in a dazzling geometric design of diagonal oak slats. The floor produced an ephemeral optical illusion, a multidimensional network that gave visitors the sense that they were floating through the gallery on a surface that changed with every step. No, actually, no one thinks that. An optical, uh, people would be falling over their feet if that were the case. People would be like, whoa, I can't walk properly. But no, they're looking up at the fucking Mona Lisa. They're not looking at the floor. What? What? Dan Brown? Dan Brown, have you even been to the Louvre? I do not think this is a thing. And so Robert Langdon's just like looking at the floor, being like, oh, that's a lovely floor. And then he spots some police tape and he's like, oh my God, is that a Caravaggio on the floor? Remember because Jacques Sunier, the curator, he tore a painting off the wall so that it would activate the security systems, dropping down the gate because he managed to run away from Silas quite a distance. Anyway, so that's what happened. And Robert Langdon's like, what the fuck? He's looking at Fash and he's like, what the devil is it doing on the floor? And he's like freaking out. And it's like, um, I don't think someone just bumped it and left it on the ground. Like it's actually a part of the crime scene, Robert. He's staring and glaring at Fash like he did it. And Fash is like, oh my God, can you calm your tits? It's a crime scene. We haven't touched it. The curator, okay, you can say his name. He's dead and naked on the floor. You can say his name. But the curator took it off the wall to activate the security system. And Langdon's like, what? He would do that to a Caravaggio? Bad curation. 
And yeah, okay, we get it. But no, Fash has to repeat himself and says, the curator, okay, was attacked in his office, fled into the grand gallery and activated the security gate by pulling that painting from the wall. The gate fell immediately, sealing off all access. This is the only door in or out of this gallery. Still don't know how the septuagenarian curator got the jump on Silas, but okay. And then Langdon was confused and he says, so the curator, just say Jacques. Like, why is this still happening? Just say Jacques. So the curator actually captured his attacker inside the Grand Gallery? And Fash is like, no dipshit. The security gate separated Sonia from his attacker. Oh, so he said Sonia, thank God. He finally said the guy's name. So then Fash says, nah, the killer shot him from the gate because we've got, you know, gun residue on the gate or whatever. And Sonia died in here alone. And so then Langdon's like, all right, well, where's his body? And then Fash says, as you probably know, the Grand Gallery is quite long. Oh, we know. Oh, we know. Dan told us. And even though we found out this three chapters ago, Langdon says the exact length was around 1500 feet, the length of three Washington monuments laid end to end. I don't care. You know what? You can just say 1500 feet. You don't have to translate that into Washington monuments for me. That means nothing. You've already told me it's a three mile walk around the perimeter and now you're telling me, oh, it's three Washington monuments laid and, okay, sure. It's a big fucking building, got it. And then Dan Brown says, equally breathtaking was the corridor's width, which easily could have accommodated a pair of side-by-side passenger trains. Uh, All right. I don't know if anyone's really ever had their breath taken away by the width of a building. The width of other things, perhaps, ladies, am I right? But the width of a building, I don't, I don't really think that's that breathtaking. And a pair of side-by-side passenger trains could fit there. Like, that's not that big. Like, I go to subway stations all the time where they fit side-by-side trains. And it doesn't seem like it's a huge wide building that I'm in. So I don't really get that. And Dan tells us that the center of the hallway was dotted by the occasional statue or colossal porcelain urn, which served as a tasteful divider and kept the flow of traffic moving down one wall and up the other. I do not give a shit. Like we know how museums work. Oh, this is so dumbed down. So then they're racing down the grand gallery because you know, there's a murder victim at the end of the aisle and Langdon felt almost disrespectful to be racing past so many masterpieces without pausing for so much as a glance. Like, 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 like what? You, you're just gonna stop and stare at the paintings while you're rushing past them? Like, of course you're not. Like, does he know that he's a part of a murder investigation? Like he's seen a photo of the dead body, so we must know. And then he thinks, not that I could see anything in this lighting anyway. Like, okay, yeah, we know it's dark. It's empty, it's dark, it's nighttime. You're in the Louvre, it's a big building. All these things we know, you don't need to tell us over and over again. But the muted crimson lighting actually conjured up a memory of one of his little incidents during Angels and Demons. And then he's talking about Victoria for a bit and how they broke up, like da 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 da, who cares? So they keep walking and Langdon's like, wow, Jacques got really far. And Fash says the whole, oh yeah, he got shot in the stomach. And as everybody knows, if you get shot in your stomach, you've got 15 minutes exactly to before you're dead. So, you know, you'd leave clues around and arrange a scavenger hunt for this guy who's an American symbologist, like obviously. And Langdon's like, whoa, it took security 15 minutes to get here. That's pretty shit. And then Fash is like, of course not, dipshit. Louvre security responded immediately to the alarm and found the grand gallery sealed. Okay, I don't think that's true. Jacques pulled the Caravaggio off the wall. The gate came down. And then he and Silas had a full on conversation. He had to recount the lie to Silas. And then Silas shot him. They had a whole uninterrupted chat. So I do not believe that Louvre security responded immediately like they might be telling Fash. They're telling you a porker. So apparently security is saying, oh yeah, we got there straight away and uh, we shouted out, but we couldn't get through the gate, obviously. And we could hear someone moving around, but what could we do? So they followed protocol, assuming it was a criminal. And then the police got there within 15 minutes and were in position. And then they raised the barricade enough to slip underneath. And then the agents went, okay, all right, whatever. There's a lot of holes in it, but let's just brush past it because I've already said it and I don't need to repeat myself like Dan Brown. And Langdon, he's like, okay, and then what happened? Like, okay, I think you know what happened, but Fash says they found no one except him. And he points down the hall. 
And Langdon looks and he's like, oh, it's just a statue. And then he's like, wait a minute, that's not a statue. That's a dead body. But of course, it's hard to see because (laughs) there's not a lot of light on in the gallery. Like, oh, my God. Basically, the corpse of the curator lay naked on the parquet floor and they've set up some lighting to make him look more visible. Okay, great. And Fash says, you saw the photograph, so this should be of no surprise. But then Langdon looks and before him was one of the strangest images he had ever seen. You've already seen it. You just got reminded that you've already seen it. But now, oh, it's the strangest thing I've ever seen. And then it says, the corpse of Jacques Sunier lay on the parquet floor exactly as it appeared in the photograph. So, okay, so you've seen it. And then he's like, wow, so he arranged himself that way? That's, that's a bit weird. And then Langdon's also thinking, oh, Sunier looked remarkably fit for a man of his years. And all of his musculature was in plain view. So he's just admiring the naked dead body of the 76-year-old Jacques Sunier. He's like, wow, keeping it tight. Hmm, props to you, mama. So he's naked, he put his clothes in a pile next to him and he's lying out spread eagled, like a child making a snow angel. Or perhaps more appropriately, like a man being drawn and quartered by some invisible force. I don't know why that's more appropriately, I think. You know, just lying out wide spread eagled pretty much conjured the image, but okay. And so also using his own blood as ink, he had drawn shit on his abdomen as a canvas. And he'd drawn a simple symbol on his flesh, five straight lines that intersected to form a five-pointed star, which is the pentacle, Dan Brown tells us. And so Langdon says, that's a pentacle, (laughs) one of the oldest symbols on earth, used over 4,000 years before Christ. And so Fash, doing his job, as a police chief investigating a murder, he says, what does that mean? And Langdon goes, ugh, telling someone what a symbol meant was like telling them how a song should make them feel. It was different for all people. And so he goes, um, symbols carry different meanings in different settings. Like, ugh, I kind of want to get into it. It's like, you're a part of an investigation, Robert. Can you just like buck up and maybe pop out a theory? And so eventually he says, primarily, the pentacle is a pagan religious symbol. And Fash is like, oh, devil worship, got it. And he's like, no, 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 no. And then he's like, oh, what was I thinking? What a mistake in my choice of vocab. Nowadays, the term pagan had become synonymous with devil worship, which is a gross misconception. And then he goes on and on about the origins of the word pagan. Uh -uh. Uh-uh. If you care so much about that, maybe Google it or read the book because I don't want to talk about it. Essentially, he says, the pentacle is a pre-Christian symbol that relates to nature worship. The ancients envisioned their world in two halves, masculine and feminine, yin and yang. When male and female were balanced, the world was in harmony. When they were unbalanced, there was chaos. The pentacle is a representative of the female half of all things, a concept known as the sacred feminine or the divine goddess. Sonia would have known that. And that's the abridged version, guys. Like it goes on for much longer than that. And so then Fash is like, Sonia drew a goddess symbol on his stomach. Like that's a bit gay. Like he said goddess in italics. Like that's why there was sarcasm in there. I don't know why you're being sarcastic, Fash. A man is dead. Let's just like, explore the theory and then maybe make a decision. And Langdon's like, well, yeah, actually, a a pentacle symbolizes Venus, the goddess of female sex and love and beauty. And Fash looks down at the naked man and goes, ugh, he grunts. Like what? He's like offended that this naked dead guy was like embracing the divine feminine on his body. Like, okay, maybe pick a battle, Fash. I don't know why you're taking a stance against this. And then Robert's like, well, since you didn't ask, I'm just gonna tell you, early religion was based on the divine order of nature. The goddess Venus and the planet Venus were one and the same. Blah, 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 powerful female concepts with ties to nature and mother earth. Fash is so over it, he's zoned out. He's like, oh, this is boring. And then Langdon thinks like, oh, you know what? I'm not gonna bring up the most graphic origin of the pentacles ties to Venus. I love that he's just like choosing not to bring things up in a murder investigation. As a young astronomy student, Langdon had been stunned to learn that planet Venus traced a perfect pentacle across the ecliptic sky every four years. As a tribute to the magic of Venus, the Greeks used her four-year cycle to organize their Olympiads, 
Nowadays, few people realize that the four-year schedule of the modern Olympics still followed the cycles of Venus. Not in 2020, babe. The coronavirus really wrecked with that one and we had the Olympics in 2021, so there goes your theory. Also, like, as a young astronomy student, Langdon was stunned. Like, what, what are you doing studying astronomy? I thought you were a symbologist. Langdon's the biggest nerd. And Fash is like, yeah, <laughs> Langdon, shut up. Like, obviously it's got to do with the devil, not this goddess bullshit. He says, your American horror movies make that point clearly. And then Langdon's like, oh, thank you, Hollywood. He thinks in italics. And he thinks, oh, the five-pointed star was now a virtual cliche in satanic serial killer movies, usually scrawled on the wall of some Satanist's apartment along with other alleged demonic symbology. Langdon was always frustrated when he saw the symbol in that context. Imagine living your life like Robert Langdon, just gonna go see The Exorcist and just walking out disappointed being like, oh, they ruined the symbol. Like, calm down. It's a movie. It's not real. Not all fiction is real like this book. This is the only book where everything is a fact. And Langdon's like, well, actually, um, despite what you see in the movies, the Pentacles demonic interpretation is historically inaccurate. Yeah, the original feminine meaning is correct. So it's like, okay, you're standing above a dead body. Like now's not the time to talk about your gripes with the movies. And then he's telling us some history on the Pentacle being like the church, wanted to eradicate pagan religions and convert the masses to Christianity. So they launched a smear campaign against the pagan gods and told everyone that their divine symbol was actually demonic. The Christians took over the symbol, blah, blah, blah. He says the same thing happened with Poseidon's trident becoming a devil's pitchfork, the wise crone's pointed hat becoming the symbol of a witch, and the pentacle became a sign of the devil. And he says, oh, and also, The US military has also perverted the pentacle and now it's our symbol of war and it's on our fighter jets and stuff. Like, why is that relevant? And Fash is like, yeah, okay, that's great. What about the positioning of the body? What do you make of that? And Langdon's like, meh, I don't know. I guess it just reinforces the reference to the pentacle and the sacred feminine. And Fash is like, what? And he says, replication. Repeating a symbol is the simplest way to strengthen its meaning. Jacques Saunier positioned himself in the shape of a five-pointed star. If one pentacle is good, two is better. Well, then what's the fifth point? I get the arms, I get the legs. What's the fifth point? His dick? Is the dick his fifth point of the star? I I don't think so. Like, why would you go do all the effort to draw a pentacle on your body and be like, you know what will really seal the deal and make them realize it's a pentacle? If I just spread out my arms and legs, that'll do it. Like, why? No. How does that help it make sense? And Fash is like, well, why is he nude then? And Langdon's stumped. He's like, I don't know. And he's like, I don't know, Mr. Fash, Mr. Bull. I don't know. But all I can tell you is that Jacques Sunier would have definitely been familiar with the pentacle as being a sign of the female deity. And Fash is like, well, why do you use his own blood as ink, huh? And Langdon, he's like, I don't know, because he didn't have a pen? Fuck with Like, I'm a symbologist. I'm not here to explain what a dying man did or did not do. And Fash says, well, actually, I believe he used blood so that the police would follow certain forensic procedures. Yeah, because they wouldn't have investigated a brutal bloody murder taking place in the Louvre unless there were blood involved. Okay. And he also says, look at his left hand, dipshit. And so he looks and there's a felt tipped marker in his hand. And then he says, Sonia was holding it when we found him. Are you familiar with this kind of pen? And Langdon looks down and he sees that it's a stylo de lumière noire. And he glances up in surprise and he's like, oh my God, he has a stylo de lumière noire? That's crazy. And I bet you're thinking, what's a stylo de lumière noire? Well, he'll tell us. It's a blacklight pen or watermark stylus. It has a specialized felt tipped marker designed for museums to place invisible marks on items. In a non-corrosive alcohol-based fluorescent ink, that was visible only under black light. Nowadays, museum maintenance staffs carried these markers on their daily rounds to place invisible tick marks on the frames of paintings that needed restoration. Okay, so a very common museum tool. You'd probably expect to see lots of these pens in the Louvre. So I don't know why he looked down, read the pen's label and was like, what? A stylo de lumière noire? The curator of the Louvre had a stylo de lumière noire? What? And so then Fash, because he's got a dramatic flair, he turns all the lights off, including the spotlight on Sonia's body. 
And Langdon's like, uh? And then he turns on a black light. And Fash says, as you may know, police use black light illumination to search crime scenes for blood and other forensic evidence. Okay. Yeah, we know what a black light is. Like we've all watched NCIS. We've all watched CSI or whatever those crime shows are. Like we, we get the concept of a black light. You didn't need to explain it to us. So he shines the black light on the body and Langdon jumps back in shock again, probably still thinking about the presence of a pen. He jumps back in shock because Sunier had written something on the parquet floor, the most beautiful, famous parquet floor in the whole entire world. He'd written something and they were his final words, glowing in purple next to his corpse. And Langdon's looking at the text and he's like, what the hell does that mean? And Fash says, that, monsieur, is precisely the question you are here to answer. And so we don't know what the text is because again, he knows how to withhold information when he wants to, but he will also tell us everything we ever needed to know, even though we already know it and have context clues. So not far away, we cut to Sonia's office and there's Lieutenant Colette. And it says, Lieutenant Colette had returned to the Louvre. I think he might be the agent slash driver. I don't know if we ever learned his name, but Lieutenant Colette, he's now in the curator's office and he's listening into the conversation. And they're recording the conversation that's going on between Langdon and Fash because clearly, They think that Langdon did it. Well, Langdon's the top suspect anyway. And he thinks, le moment de vérité, which I think means the moment of truth. And he closes his eyes and he's like settling in to enjoy the rest of the conversation now being taped inside the Grand Gallery. And that's the end of that chapter. And finally, we go to chapter seven, which is a bit of a shorty. And it's another locale. And it's the Church of Saint-Sulpice. And of course, we're going to get the layout. We're (laughs) We're going to know everything we need to know about the church. The modest dwelling within the church of Saint-Sulpice was located on the second floor of the church itself to the left of the choir balcony. Oh, okay, to the left of the choir balcony. That's good because I was gonna go and visit and look for it on the right of the choir balcony and I would have been really confused. So thank you, Lonely Planet Dan Brown. It's a two room suite with a stone floor and minimal furnishings. It's the home to Sister Sandrine Biel. While the nearby convent was her formal residence, she preferred the quiet of the church and had made herself quite comfortable upstairs with a bed, a phone, and a hot plate. The three things you only ever really need, am I right, ladies? A bed, a phone, and a hot plate. Luxury! So Dan tells us that Sister Sandrine is the church's conservatrice d'affaires. So she's respon- Uh, My French pronunciation isn't great, guys. Like, I've I've got to apologize for that up front. But, okay. She's responsible for overseeing all non-religious aspects of church operations, such as general maintenance, hiring support staff, securing the building after hours, and ordering supplies like communion wine and wafers. That- that feels like a religious aspect of the church operations. I thought she was only overseeing the non-religious aspect, but whatever. Okay. So now she's waking up. It's the middle of the night. Her phone's ringing. And so she answers it and says, Soir Sandrine, église sans sopice. And so then the person on the other end of the phone responds and it says, hello, sister, the man said in French. Well, no, that's English, actually. Hello, sister is English. And she just spoke in French. So I don't know now why we're getting it translated, but we're being told that he's speaking in French. So apparently it's her boss. And she's a bit freaked out because he's never called late at night in the whole 15 years that she's been working as the conservatrice d'affaires à sans sulpice. And so he's like, oh, sorry if I've woken you up, sis, but I have a favor to ask of you. I just received a call from an influential American bishop. Perhaps you know him, Manuel Arangorosa? And she says, the head of Opus Dei? Of course I know him. Who in the church doesn't? And then she's given her own little personal backstory on the rise of Opus Dei. She says, Aringaros's conservative prelature had grown powerful in recent years. Recent, how, how recent is recent? <sighs> Their ascension to grace was jump-started in 1982. Okay, so that's not recent then. That's not recent. When Pope John Paul II unexpectedly elevated them to a personal prelature of the Pope, officially sanctioning all of their practices. Suspiciously, Opus Dei's elevation occurred the same year the wealthy sect allegedly had transferred almost $1 billion into the Vatican's Institute for Religious Works, commonly known as the Vatican Bank. Okay, all right, Sister Sulpice, giving us a lot of the backstory which we already had from two chapters ago. Thanks, Sister Sandrine from Saint Sulpice, not Sister Sulpice. There's a lot of S words in that, isn't there? Hard for a boy to keep up. 
And then she's telling us how the Pope had placed some Opus Dei founder on the fast track for sainthood, blah, blah, fucking blah. Oh, I know so much about the Opus Dei, and we've barely even mentioned Da Vinci so far. This should be called the Opus Dei Code, like far out. There's two things we've learned in this book. It's all about Opus Dei and all about the floor of the Grand Gallery. The two major takeaways from the Da Vinci Code. So basically, the boss of the Abbey, he's saying, hey, sis, Bishop Aaron Grosser asked me a favour. One of his little mates is coming to Paris and he really wants to see the church. And he wants to do that now. Can you give him a tour at like 1am in the morning? And she's like, I can't wait till the morning. And he says, nah. And so she's like, well, all right, well, I guess I'm not sleeping then, of course. And so they hang up and she's puzzled. And she's just lying in bed for a little bit thinking, what's going on? Her 60 year old body did not wake as fast as it used to. (laughs) So we know she's 60 years old. Okay, that's important. And she's thinking about how Opus Dei had always made her uneasy, always. Even though they only rose to prominence recently, they've always made her uneasy. Beyond the prelature's adherence to the arcane ritual of corporal mortification, their views on women were medieval at best. She had been shocked to learn that female numeraries were forced to clean the men's residence hall for no pay while the men were at mass. Women slept on hardwood floors while the men had straw mats. Okay, that sucks. And the women were also forced to endure additional requirements of corporal mortification, all as added penance for the original sin. What, what woman in Opus Dei is just running with that, being like, yeah, that's, that sounds great. They are brainwashed, that's fucked. Like we already knew about the corporal mortification and that they had to enter the building at 243 Lexington Avenue from separate entrances and they were cut off from each other, which... Sounded like a nice little fantasy in my head, but the reality of it's very bad. Although I will say, she says, women slept on hardwood floors while the men had straw mats. Sleeping on straw mats doesn't sound that luxurious either. (laughs) Sounds like it's a lose-lose situation for everyone, but yes, the women have it worse. And she's thinking like how morally opposed she is to Opus Dei, but then she gets out of bed and she's like, oh well, (laughs) it is what it is. Better give this sexist priest a tour of the church at night. Let's do it. But then she feels a chill through her flesh, an unexpected apprehension. And she thinks, what's this? Women's intuition. And then again, she goes, meh, must be nothing. (laughs) And she just (laughs) gets up and gets ready to let that guy have a tour. And that's the end of the chapter. I love the like, oh my God, I've just had a premonition. Something bad's going to happen. Oh my God, women's intuition. Oh, well, (laughs) cut to, she does nothing about it. Classic Sister Sangerine from the sans Piece. All right, well, that's it then. Okay, so next week, I think we'll get to the Da Vinci Code of it all with Sonier's message that he left behind. Dan Brown's really stringing us along, isn't he? But if you were reading this book wanting to find out more about Opus Dei, well, then congrats, you would have loved the last few chapters. Congratulations. So I will see you guys next week for the next few chapters. And again, if you want to pop over to Patreon, patreon.com slash breaking down bad books check it out ratings and reviews are also appreciated thank you everyone who has left a rating or a review and you can go to speakpipe.com slash breaking down bad books if you want to leave a voicemail so i'll see you next time bye hey there there. do you like death ghosts and hollywood history why are you whispering yeah yeah of course That's creepy. And so are we. I'm Tia. And I'm Patrick. And we're hosts of Hollywood's Haunted, the podcast. We're here to research everything evil and bring it right to your ear for your convenience. Our next season, we'll be discussing such morbid topics as the Black Dahlia. The darker side of Disneyland. Possessions. And much, much more. Plus, we get to share our crazy stories with guest hosts. Fellow podcasters. And especially you. So come hang out with some weirdos who are mad about the macabre. Macabre? Macabre? Macabre. That dark stuff. Yeah, dark stuff. And get ready for some of Hollywood's biggest haunted secrets to be revealed. You can check us out on iHeartRadio, Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you get your podcast. Send your burning thoughts, frustrations, and grievances on this latest chapter of this shitty book to 
breakingdownpod at gmail.com or on Twitter at podbreakingdown and Instagram at breakingdownbadbooks. You can visit www.breakingdownbadbooks.com for all the listen links, contact information, merch and more. To support the show on Patreon and gain access to exclusive ad-free bonus episodes, visit patreon.com slash breakingdownbadbooks. Ratings and reviews on your preferred podcast platform are also a fun, free way to support the show. Breaking Down Bad Books is hosted by me, Nathan Brown, who you can follow on Instagram and Twitter at NathanBrown90. Thanks for listening and happy reading.